of the Lord this morning. Amen. Expecting wonderful things for the Lord to meet us here today. Amen. You got a need this morning. I'd like to lift your hand just to ask for prayer in your life or your family this morning. God sees his hands across this sanctuary this morning. Let's go to the throne room of heaven together right now. Lord Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, we pray and ask that you administer in hearts and lives this morning. God, you know all the needs, Lord, of those today. God, you know, God, those hands that were raised across the sanctuary this morning. I pray, Lord Jesus, even now, that you would bless, Lord. I pray even now, Lord Jesus, that you would move in hearts and lives. Lord God, you're right able this morning. Lord, to touch, Lord God. Laura, God, you're able this morning to touch Aubrey. God, we pray together this morning. Lord, those in the hospital, those, God, that need a miracle in their lives this morning, whatever it may be, Lord, God, you're greater than any problem, greater than any difficulty. We stand now in the grace 
grace of God this morning. Lord, pray even now that you would reveal yourself, Lord God, in this service today. Lord God, let your presence, let the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit begin to move. Come on, saints of God. Let's lift our hands and give you praise this morning. Lord, we thank you, God, even now that the answer is already on the way. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Come. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill this tabernacle this morning. Fill this tabernacle with your presence, I pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Come, Lord. Jesus.
each other 10 years. Um, so that's a fun story. But first of all, thank you so much to, for having us. Thank you for your support. Um, I, it's it good to be back. Kara's happy to be back too. And we're really excited to share our story with you um, because tomorrow is our six-month wedding anniversary. And God has been with us the whole way. Um, it's really been an incredible story for us. Um, I was with In Character School of Ministry, who used to live here in the area and serve with the West Florida District, and that's where I met Kara. As we were both getting ready to go into missions, I went to serve in Laos and then in Thailand working with Change the Map, and Josh Jacks, who is also a good friend of Pine Forest, and Kara has been serving in Spain for several years, and um, I'm going to let her talk a little bit about that. Good morning, everyone. It has been, I don't think I've been here probably for, it's been about 10 or 11 years. So if you have a really good memory, I commend you. Um, but it's wonderful to be back, and it's good to be back married this time. Um, I actually am from this area. I grew up in Crestview, you know, just a little ways down the interstate. And actually some of my 
family um, is joining us this morning. My, these are not our children on the front row here. Um, these are our sweet nieces and you know, they don't have a lot of opportunities to come travel with us and hear us speak. So we're really excited that they're here this morning. But if you want to uh, connect with us after today, follow along with our journey. There's a lot of ways that you can do that. There should be a QR code yet right there. Um, so you can scan that and um, you can find our social media. You can sign up for our newsletter. If you like to do things a little more old school by hand, we have a table in the foyer. And on that table, we have took it away from me. We have um, some prayer cards that you can take home. We would love for everyone to take one of these, put it on your fridge, put it in your Bible, a place where you will just remember to pray for us because we cannot go and do what we do without the church lifting up our arms, lifting up our names and our request in prayer. Uh, we send out periodic uh, updates through newsletter and if you'd like to receive that um, to your email a few times a year, you can also sign up for that in the foyer, but we are just so thankful. Before we go any, any further, um, this church has been a huge supporter for both of us for our whole time in missions, and we are just so thankful for your prayers, for your giving for so many years. Um, I think we both have so many testimonies of lives being changed, the kingdom being furthered, and you are a part of that. You may never have gotten on a plane and packed your bags and gone with us, um, but that's the beautiful thing about the body of Christ and God's kingdom is that we're doing this together. You are part of our team. Whether you knew us before today or whether you want to know us after today, you are a part of this, and we just want to say thank you because when we are traveling around, whether it's in the States or whether we are overseas, we feel your prayers. Um, I think we just heard a story of a pastor. Um, he felt prompted at 5 a.m. to pray for this missionary. And so he pull, he had his card. He pulled it out. He just started praying. So he sent him a text a little later saying like, hey, I just wanted to let you know um, around 5 a.m. this morning, the Lord was prompted prompted me to pray for you. And this missionary was overseas in a sensitive country. And he actually, he had this very specific thing happening with the government at that time. And it went favorably because of his prayers. Isn't that awesome? That is the power of our prayers. And prayer is, um, of course, it's, a, it's an important part of our ministry, but our, our story, how we are married today, is truly because of prayers. We have a lot of people in our lives, our family, our friends, a lot of churches and pastors um, and people in the churches praying that, that we would meet someone, just that we would have a partner to do life and ministry with. And a few years ago, I was heading back to Spain. I was just at the tail end of raising my budget. Jacob had just returned to the states to start his um, time of itineration. And um, we just so happened to cross paths over in Sneeds, Florida at a pastor's meeting. And, um, you know, I, it's a whole story. I was not happy to see him. And apparently that was very evident on my face. But at that same time, like literally down to the minute, there was a prayer meeting happening in Crestview at my home church. My mom was at that meeting. She's a praying woman. She goes just about every single week. And our missions pastor also just so happened to be at this prayer meeting. And um, the leader of the meeting is kind of closing things down, asks if there's any additional prayer requests, you know, as a good leader would do. And um, our missions pastor kind of raises her hands and she shares that the staff of, of my home church they pray every week. They didn't pray that I would get back to Spain, which frustrated me. I was a little upset about that. But they, would, they specifically prayed that I would meet somebody before I went back. And so they're seeing this like, we're coming down to the wire. She's getting close and she hasn't met anyone yet. So she shares this with the church prayer meeting. Like, you guys, you know, we need to pray for her. Like, she's about to go back. We need her to meet someone. So the church prays, and then I walk into, you know, miles and miles away, I walk into the church, and there Jacob is. Um, I, I just, 
to add to that, I'm not from Florida. I'm from Virginia. So um, I had I had a meeting that I was supposed to come to down in Florida, and I had uh, called up the district superintendent at the time, uh, Pastor Tommy Moore. We love him. And he said, hey, uh, I can't meet you for lunch or coffee, but we've got these meetings, so just come to the meetings. And I had no idea they were happening. So I just well, I go to the meetings, and Kara walks in. I'm the first person she sees. And... Uh, What's funny is we, we hung out that night and um, as a big group, a whole bunch of us, but Kara was the life of the party, and I'm, I'm like several people away from her. She can't see me, but I can see her, you know, and I'm like, uh, all these feelings came, and I, I, just, I just thought, man, she's, she's like an incredible woman, and she's even, like, grown even more since I knew her 10 years ago. We hadn't seen each other in, in it had been seven years at that point, um, but I got back in my car and I said, God, if I don't ask Kara out, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. And, um, and I believe that the Holy Spirit was prompting things during that dinner, during that time together because of that prayer time. And so I started fasting and praying. For two weeks, we had these pastors meetings, so we kept seeing each other. And um, um, I got a little bold with her. I started kind of talking to her a little bit, seeing, like, can we even be friends again, like that kind of thing. And uh, everyone was like, why is Jacob flirting with Kara so much? And I didn't realize. But um, all that to say, it all had to do with prayer. I was fasting and praying this whole time. Like, God, am I supposed to ask Kara out? She's going to Spain. She's leaving soon. And Spain and Thailand, if you don't know, are not close to each other. <laughs> Thailand's in, in, in Asia, in Southeast Asia. Spain is in Europe. And in the Assemblies of God, when someone's in a different region of the world, basically you're never going to see them again. And so I was like, well, we're, this is, there's no point in even thinking about this because we'll never see each other again. And, uh, and God just worked it out through prayer. And I asked her out the very last meeting, and we went on our first date, September 8th. We kept it hidden so nobody knew that we were dating. <laughs> and, uh, and God just, thing after thing, was confirming to us that this relationship was ordained by Him, that we're supposed to be together. And so we got married and on July 29th, and it's been six months, and it's been amazing. I, I call it a miracle when I tell people our what God has done in our lives and our story. Like we are so thankful. Um, one thing that was a no-brainer, and when we you know kind of started talking and dating, was that missions was our future. Um, we both have always had a really deep and passionate burden for the unreached, and just for dis and for discipleship and for going to the ends of the earth and. One thing that's been really interesting for us to reconcile is Spain and Thailand are different in every single way. There was nothing that was overlapping about our ministries, um, but deep down inside of us are, are just knowing that we're called to missions and knowing that we are called to do what God tells us to do. That really united us, and so we started um, this long journey of praying through, Lord, where are you sending us now? And we did get the advice to, um, for us to go our separate ways. Get married, she'll continue to go to Spain, you go to Thailand, and you guys can just meet up every once in a while. Um, that was legitimate advice we were given, um, which we, it, did not, it did not resonate. We did not feel like that was of the Lord. Um, but we, have, we were just praying for a solid year. God speak to us. Lord, where is it? Is it Spain? Is it Thailand? Is it somewhere totally new that's not on our radar? And a lot of voices were coming in, but we just never felt like any of the voices were the Lord's. And about back in September, um, the, the Assemblies of God right now, they have, it's called the Buddhist Hindu Priority Launch. So never in the history of the Assemblies of God has there been an emphasis to specifically pray and reach the Buddhists and the Hindus of the world until now. And the recent years past, maybe you're familiar with this, but we put a lot of emphasis on reaching Muslims. Praise God. And there have been prayer movements every single Friday night or every single Friday for years because that's the Muslim holy day. And as a result of that, you know, the fact you well He's going to say a lot of this. <laughs> um, but we're just seeing revival break out in that part of the world. It's incredible. 
That's what our prayers can do. And so now we're shifting our focus as a fellowship to the Hindus and the Buddhists of the world. And so back in September, we were privileged to be able to attend a kind of a soft launch of this priority. So we're in this room. It's full of missionaries and it's full of pastors from all over the states. And all of these missionaries are working with Buddhists and Hindu people. And then you have me. We're freshly married. I still feel like I am a missionary to Europe, which I won't talk about this morning why Europe needs missionaries, but I will tell you later if you want to know. Um, but I, I just find myself in this room. It's actually in the Bible Museum in D.C. If you ever have a chance to go, it's incredible. And I am just like, what am I doing here? And he's like on cloud nine. This is his element. He talks to everyone about, about Buddhists, about praying for Buddhists, about, you know, what does Buddhism actually look like, differences between Christianity. So he's just like in heaven right now, and I felt so out of place. And then I started here, you know, I'm listening to the speakers, and I really felt like the Lord started telling me to pay attention, and I felt like he started speaking to me individually in this giant room of pastors and missionaries. And there was one statistic that changed everything for us. It changed my heart. There are approximately two and a half billion Buddhists and Hindus in our world today. Two and a half billion. Let that number sink in for a second. In the Assemblies of God World Missions, which I do recognize, we are not the only missions organization. We are not the only people reaching these people, okay? But in our organization, at any given moment, we have about 250 missionaries on the field reaching Buddhists and Hindus. 250 missionaries trying to reach 2.5 billion. We're only two people, but in that moment, I knew that's what God was asking us to do. Because if we can add to that number and if we can start sharing our story and start, start recruiting other people, sharing the burden, we need that number to increase. We need the, the number of missionaries to increase and we need to hear about the number of Buddhists and Hindus decreasing. All for the glory of God. Jacob's going to share a little bit more about that with you, but... Um, we've just recently, we, we officially made this decision in, um, at the end of November, beginning of December. So you're one of our few churches that we're actually sharing, um, that we've heard from the Lord, and that we have clear direction, and that we know more than ever where God is leading us, and, and have such a clear picture for what that's going to look like um, with our ministry there, which I'll let Jacob share about as we go along. And so... God has called us back to Thailand, me back to Thailand, she's coming too, and uh, we're going to join a training hub for new missionaries to reach Buddhists in Chiang Mai, Thailand, so I, we, we were in Bangkok, myself, Josh, and Tanya, the whole team I was a part of, and pretty much everyone that we've worked with very closely is now moving to Chiang Mai, Thailand to work with the local Thai church, but also to train up new missionaries to reach Buddhist people. And so our heart for this as a couple is to have healthy missionaries who are called to a lifetime of service among Buddhist people who will spend the rest of their lives overseas reaching people for Jesus in the Buddhist world. And so that's what we're going to be a part of. We're going to start out with language study. Uh, Kara doesn't know any Thai. This is her third foreign language she's going to have to study. And um, I, I speak some Thai. I'm at like a second grade level, so your second graders are smarter than me. And um, and so we're going to have to take, I'm, I'm going to take it, but a sixth grade level Thai language test by the end of our first year. Um, so that's a big part of what we're going to do. But also, we are part of a ministry called Change the Map, and we'll talk about that later, and I think a lot of you know about that. Um, but Kara said that 2.5 billion Buddhists and Hindus are in the world today, and 70 million of the Buddhists live in Thailand. And so we've got a lot of people to reach, 70 million. And um, we have a ministry in Thailand that's done an incredible job of finding the statistics. They've gone to every single village to find out whether or not they've received the gospel, if anyone's ever come and preached the gospel to them. 
and this is every ethnic group in Thailand, and only 6% of the villages that exist in Thailand have ever heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'll talk about that again a little bit later. But, um, so, as we've talked about our story, one thing that has become very clear is that prayer is important. And the thing that is going to change the spiritual atmosphere of the Buddhist and Hindu world and going to bring Thai people to Jesus is prayer and intercession. We believe that intercession for lost souls is the most important thing for bringing them to Jesus. Yeah. You heard those numbers, right? Only, only 250 missionaries on the ground working for 2.5 billion people. We need to have intercession for these people in the church. And we believe that our prayers are powerful and effective. Amen? Oh, yes. Your prayers have been answered. We heard a testimony this morning of someone who was healed of cancer. God hears our prayers and He answers. And we believe in our ministry that, yeah, we're going to be there. We're going to be there in person. But the stronghold of Buddhism will only fall if you, the church, are in America praying for them. Yes. And so we're going to talk about prayer today, and I'm going to ask you to pray with us, to join with us in prayer, as many of you are already doing. So let's, let's pray before we get into the Word. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for having us uh, in a place where we can pray and worship together, where we can receive your Spirit and God, you said where two or more are gathered together, your spirit is there. And we believe that, Lord. We believe that the one true living God is here and he hears us. And we believe that our prayers are powerful and effective. And God, I ask that you would help us today to receive the word that you have for us, whatever it may be. Even if it's something that I don't specifically say, but you just spark a thought in somebody's mind that brings them closer to you and draws them towards a life of prayer and intercession. We thank you, God, that you hear us and that you answer our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So one of the greatest truths of Scripture, and therefore of the universe, is that God does not change. Amen. amen? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We also know that God does not change His mind. It says it very clearly in Scripture. However, this might shake some of us. Did you know there's actually one thing that God will change his mind about? It blew me away when somebody told me, and I've read the Bible many times. <laughs> and I thought, really? God changes his mind about something? What does God change his mind about? What is that one thing? The Bible says that God will change his mind about punishing sinful people. God will change his mind about punishing sinful people, but... It requires intercession. Come on. Let's look at Ezekiel 22, 30 through 21. Ezekiel 22, 30 through 21 says, I looked for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I searched for someone to stand in the gap in the wall so I wouldn't have to destroy the land. But I found no one. Come on. So now I will pour out my fury on them consuming them with the fire of my anger. I will heap on their heads the full penalty for all their sins. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. Yes. Now this was a bitter moment in the history of Israel. They had struggled over the centuries to stay faithful to Yahweh as the one true God. Yes. But in the past, they had always turned back to Him. They had always repented, and He had always relented from pouring His wrath out on them. But at this time, in Ezekiel's prophecy, the people refused to hear Ezekiel's <clears throat> warning. And so God did what He said He'd do, and He destroyed them. He destroyed the people of Israel. But I don't want to focus on that punishment that God poured out. I want us to focus today on the promise that God made. He said He would not destroy the people if He could find someone to stand in the gap. But He could not. The truth of this scripture is sinful, simple and extremely important. God wants someone to stand in the gap for those who are disobedient to him. We are those people. I'm sure most of you know the story of the missionary Jonah. He's considered like the worst missionary who ever lived, right? <laughs> God told him, hey Jonah, there's these people, Nineveh, they hate me. They, they, they're terrible people. 
and I want you to go and preach repentance to them. And what did Jonah do? He said, no, I hate the people of Nineveh. They're fish slappers. So he went the opposite direction. He got on a boat, and he ran away from the call of God on his life. And I pray that Kara and I never be missionaries like that. We've prayed for a really long time to know exactly what God wanted us to do. So Jonah ran away. But God said, I need someone to stand in the gap for Nineveh. I need an intercessor. So, sent a storm. The pirates threw him over. They weren't doing anything, but they threw him over the boat. He got in the water. A big fish swallowed Jonah. You all know the story, or maybe you don't. So, this is good news. <laughs> Jonah was swallowed by a big fish. The fish took him to the land that would bring him to Nineveh, spit him out. And he said, well, I've only got one option. I have to go to the people of Nineveh and preach repentance to them. Yes. Now, why didn't Jonah want to go? The sad story is, is that Jonah hated the people of Nineveh. He hated them. I wonder how many of us harbor hatred towards the people in our heart and are unwilling to intercede for them. That just came to me just now. But he hated those people. And God said, you know what? You better preach repentance to them. Even in his hatred, Jonah went and preached repentance to them. Because uh, he, hate, he didn't want to preach because he knew what would happen. He knew they would repent. And they did. And what happened? Did God destroy the city? He didn't. The people repented. And Jonah went up on a hill and he said, Okay, God, I hate those people. Please destroy them. They didn't get destroyed because they repented. All because he obeyed to intercede on their behalf. God is not willing that any should perish, but someone has to stand in the gap for those who are disobedient to Him. Intercession is the key to lost souls being saved. Honestly, in today's generation, it's hard to imagine that anyone in the world has not heard the good news of Jesus Christ. It really is hard to imagine. We have technology, we have the internet, but the reality is there are 17,446 people groups on the earth today. 17,446 unique ethno-linguistic groups. That means you have to speak a different language to bring the gospel to them. 17,000. 7,391 of those people groups have less than 2% Christians among them. Many of them 1%. Many of them 0% Christians. We call them unreached people groups. Hopefully you've heard of them before. If there's less than 2% of a people group that has believers among them, called an unreached people group. We call them unreached because that means those so few number of Christians, they might be completely alone. They don't have the resources to reach their people with the gospel. There's no churches among them. Most of them have no Bible in their own language. And so we call them unreached because they still need gospel access to their people. And that's why we send global workers to those places. In unreached people groups, 98% of the people have never met a Christian and probably never met, never will meet a Christian in their entire life. There's no church nearby. There's no Bible. Imagine that. In Thailand, I said 6% of the villages have ever received the gospel. We still have a lot of work to do, and that's why we're going to Thailand. Imagine that you've never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. All of you heard it today. We sang it in a song, right? Yes. Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth. He lived a sinless life. He died on a cross for our sins. And then He rose to life so that we could spend eternity with our Father in heaven. And 3.4 billion people in the world today have never heard that. It took me two seconds to tell you that. Good news of Jesus Christ. 3.4 billion have never heard Jesus laid down his life while we were still sinners, making the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate act of intercession. And yet, here we are, not interceding on their behalf. And Jesus gave his life. What are we willing to give? While we're called as global workers, as missionaries, to go preach in person to reach those people, God is calling the church to pray. Intercession changes the mind of God yeah. on behalf of the disobedient. Like I mentioned earlier, one of the great mysteries of life is the fact that prayer works, right? Yeah. It's incredible. We don't understand exactly. Sometimes God answers the prayers in the way that we want. Sometimes He doesn't. But we know that our God hears. Yeah. Yeah. 
And there's 3.4 billion people in the world today who don't know that there's a God who hears and who answers and who gave his life for them. Sometimes uh, prayer brings healing. Sometimes prayer brings some little thing happens in your life just to remind you that God is there and he hears. Sometimes it brings relationships together, like Kara and myself. But sometimes, and most importantly, prayer brings salvation. There are several times in the life of Moses when God wanted to destroy Israel. So Moses, one of the very first people amongst the Israelites, released them from captivity in Egypt, and he led the people of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years, and God started giving them the Ten Commandments and the law and telling them there's going to be great redemption for the world through my people Israel, if only you will obey me. So let's look at this famous example of when Moses had to intercede for the people of Israel in Exodus 32, 7 through 14. So in Exodus 32, 7 through 14, the Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. Uh, so, I'm going to pause right there. Moses was up on a mountain talking to God, the cloud of God's presence. The, the people of Israel could literally see the cloud of God's presence. They know he's up there. They're like, there's the living God. He's talking to Moses. And Moses is receiving the Ten Commandments. God is carving them on a tablet. He's telling Moses all this stuff that he wants for Israel. And in the meantime, the people of Israel are down on the, uh, on the bottom of the mountain. And they're like, we don't know where God is. We need to worship somebody, so let's, let's make cat, a golden idol for ourselves, like the, a golden cat. So they created an idol while they could see the cloud of God up on the mountain. They could see it. It says they could see it. And they decided that they weren't going to worship that God anymore, the one true living God. They were going to make idols for themselves to worship. So God got angry. So he said, quick, go down the mountain. Your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. How quickly we turn away. They have melted down gold and made a calf, and they have bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them, and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. He was going to leave Moses alone to start over. But Moses tried to pacify the Lord his God. O oh Lord, he said, why are you so angry with your own people whom you brought from the land of Egypt with such great power and such a strong hand? Why let the Egyptians say... Their God rescued them with the evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountains and wiping them out from the face of the earth. Turn away from your fierce anger. This is intercession here. Change your mind about this terrible disaster you have threatened against your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You bound yourself with an oath to them, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven, and I will give them all this land that I have promised to your descendants and they will possess it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster he had threatened to bring to his people. Moses changed God's mind about pouring his wrath on the children of Israel. The children of Israel did repent after this, but it was only after Moses stayed in the presence of God and pleaded with God on Israel's behalf. And then he went down to the people of Israel and called them to repentance. And this is not the only time this happened in the life of Moses. He is constantly interceding on behalf of the Israelites. Moses even said later in Exodus 32 that he himself would rather die than see the people of Israel punished. It's time for us to intercede for the lost. I want to both challenge you and encourage you. Is there a lost loved one in your life that you need to be interceding for? Or someone that you have been praying for whose life hasn't changed yet? Keep on praying. Are you willing to die for their salvation? That's what Moses was willing to do. Jesus said we need to be persistent in prayer. Paul called the process of interceding wrestling in prayer. Have you ever watched a wrestling match? Anybody? <laughs> wrestling in prayer. It takes hard work just to prepare to wrestle, right? 
And then these guys, they get into the they get into the ring and they wrestle and they use every muscle in their body. By the end, they're completely wiped out, drenched in sweat, and there's nothing left to give because they've given everything in the wrestling match. That's what he tells us to do in prayer. Give it all. Intercede on behalf of those who are lost by wrestling in prayer. Do we wrestle in prayer? Do we toil in prayer? That's the kind of intercession that we're supposed to have. And like the Bible says in James, our prayers are powerful and effective. It says the, the prayers of the righteous avail much. Are you righteous today? It's not our own righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ. We don't do it on our own works. We do it by the works of Christ. And because His righteousness is on us, our prayers are answered through His power, through His glory, through His Spirit. I, there's so many things that happen today. I just want to keep preaching. <laughs> but um, So Kara and I have committed to continue working in the Assemblies of God, which with this initiative called Change the Map, Prayer for Buddhists. Many of you have heard about it. Many of you know about it. Um, many of you are praying with us for the Buddhists. So Change the Map came into being about 13 years ago because after decades of ministry in Thailand, our director, Mark Doreen, he realized that the percentage of Christians in Thailand had not changed after two decades. It was less than 1%, and it stayed less than 1% for 20 years. And he said, what is going on? Why is Thailand not changing? All of the Buddhist countries, as a matter of fact, had stayed at around 2%, and on average, 2% or fewer Christians among all of the Buddhist countries. And he said, what is going on? Why has there been no change? And then he was talking to a colleague of ours who serves in a Muslim country, and he said, you know, in, in the Muslim countries, people are having visions and dreams and, of Jesus and miracles. And Mark said, well, that's not fair. That's not happening in the Buddhist world. And our colleague Dwayne, he said, remember that for decades now, there has been fasting and prayer for Muslims for 40 years. Fasting and prayer for Muslims once a week on Friday. And it was only within the last 10 years that we started seeing prayer, miracles happening, visions and dreams of Jesus in untold numbers, and revivals so much so that Iran is the fastest growing Christian population in the world. Prayer is changing the Muslim world. And so Mark said, well, we're going to do that in the Buddhist world. We're going to change the map of the Buddhist world for the kingdom and the glory of God, and we're going to do it through prayer. And so he started to change the map. And since he started to change the map, I'm happy to tell you that we have heard stories of dreams and visions of Jesus. We have had miracles happen. We have had people coming to Jesus in untold numbers because of our prayer. It's the only answer to why this is happening. Suddenly, when people started praying, the people started repenting in Thailand and in other Buddhist countries, in Laos. I've got such cool stories if you want to talk to me later about some things that have happened. Um, we've got a video. Is it all right if we take time to watch it? Um, some of you may have seen it. We've got a video, Change the Map video. Um, I want you to see just a little bit. In the year 1813, Adoniram Judson, a missionary to Burma, looked over thousands of temples and pagodas and spoke these prophetic words. Weep over your falling temples. Retire from the scenes of your past greatness. The churches of Jesus will soon supplant these idolatrous monuments and the chantings of Buddha will die away before the Christian hymn of praise. Judson did not live to see the fulfillment of this prophecy.
After 200 years of missionary labor, Buddhism still looks as strong and immovable as the fortress of Jericho did. The gospel impact on the Buddhist world seems like small cracks in these walls that have stood for hundreds and in some places even thousands of years. Nearly one billion people live imprisoned by Buddhism and its demanding rituals. Places like Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam are less than 5% Christian, with Thailand, Nepal, Cambodia, Japan, and others with less than 1%. Something has to change. As we circle these massive walls, we know that powerful, fervent prayer is the key to seeing them crumble. Focused intercession has the power to kick down doors, to break chains, to set the captives free. Will you march with an army of prayer warriors for the Buddhist world? Your prayers can change a heart change a city, change a nation, and change the map. Kara and I believe in intercession so much that change the map is going to be a key part of what we do in ministry. Uh, we'll keep working with Josh Jacks, the media director, and um, because we believe that lost souls are desperate and dying and in need of intercession. Yes. So we mentioned the walls of Jericho in there. And something that uh, Mark Batterson pointed out is that God said to Joshua, See, I have given into thine hands Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. Before they ever marched around the walls, before they ever had an attack plan, God said, I have given yeah. into your hands Jericho. He's already done it. Yeah. And all they had to do was obey. All they had to do was walk around the walls in prayer and in praise. Yeah. And God also said to us, in concern with our prayer and in concern with our sin, He said, I have made you more than conquerors. We are already victorious through Jesus Christ. We are already conquerors, more than conquerors. All we have to do is pray. I've got lots of stories of friends who need to hear the good news of Jesus. I have lots of stories of friends who have heard the good news of Jesus. And there's a spiritual stronghold holding them back that's keeping them from deciding to follow Jesus. And I want to ask you to pray for them. I've got one friend in Thailand. He's also good friends with Josh. His name is Gone. And he is so close to following Jesus. I'm not going to tell you his story today, but I want you to know that, that there are people who are just so close and there's something holding them back. And we believe it is through your prayers and intercession that people are going to decide to follow Jesus. So there's a lot of things you can do right now. First of all, you can start praying today. You can pray for those loved ones in your life who are lost. You can wrestle in prayer for them. You can uh, go back home. You can write their name down and commit to pray every day for that lost loved one. I promise you, God answers our prayers. Yes. We don't know when. It might, be, it might be several years in the future, decades even, but God answers our prayers. Yes, yes. Second, I want, I want you to think about your own life. If you're not in a relationship with Jesus today, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. There, Pastor Gene would love to talk to you. If you're concerned about your own, your own salvation, your own relationship with Jesus, go talk to him about how you can follow Jesus right now. I, I firmly believe it's not just a one-time raise your hand, okay, I want to be a Christian. It's a lifelong call, a commitment to say, I surrender my life to Christ. And so I'd like for you to go talk to Pastor Gene if you feel like you want to have a relationship with Jesus today. And the last thing I want to do is ask you to pray with us for Change the Map. Um, we have a QR code. Um, it might be available for the screen, but we also have it on our table out there. You can join Change the Map. So if you've got a phone, you can take a picture of this thing. You can scan it. Join our app. And on the app, we have a page where um, we'll be posting more updates now that we've told everyone we're going to Thailand. Um, but you can join us in prayer. And you can get weekly prayer moments where we all pray together 
And our goal in the next three years is to have 50,000 people praying every week for Buddhists. And we believe that strongholds will fall because of our prayers. So thank you so much for having us. Please come connect with us. Sign up for our emails in the back there. Um, and if there's anything else that we can do to help you connect in prayer, please, please don't hesitate to ask because we know that God is going to do incredible things. Thank you, Pastor Pelzer. Amen. No, I want Kara to come, and I, I want us to join around this couple. You know, they're they're newly married, young couple, taking on a great challenge. If you will, step out in front of the flowers here, if you will. And I need some prayer warriors to come. You know, as he referred to the walls of Jericho coming down, I, I heard a, a worship leader this morning said that, you know, he talked, he heard theologians talk about those walls falling down. It says, and they believe that they literally fell down in such a way that they became a ramp for them to enter the sea. God has something for this young couple like only God knows. But you and I can be a part of it. Lifting them up in our prayers. Believing God to touch their lives. Step out. Come on. Gather around them. Reach your hands this way this morning. All over the sanctuary today. Lord, Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning. Lord God, I pray that you touch for this couple. Lord, we pray the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, to ever be with them. Lord God, to be anointing upon them, Lord God, to do, Lord God, much greater than they can even think possible. Lord, that the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord God, set upon their lives, upon their ministry, Lord. God, to bless them. I pray, Lord Jesus, now, in agreement with them, that the will of God be accomplished greatly tonight. Lord, that souls would change their minds to come to you, Lord. God, I pray for this. Lord, that are lost souls around this world. Lord, I pray for these this morning. That are lost even here this morning. Lord, your Holy Spirit, God, move in their hearts and their lives. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Holy Spirit, even now. Come fill this place, Lord God. Touch lives. Touch them, Lord God, with anointing, Lord God, to go with them. To protect them. We pray that hedge of your protective hand be upon them greatly this morning. Lord God, to anoint them to supply their needs, Lord, their means. Lord, to fulfill what you called them to do, Lord. Lord God, let there be a boldness in their hearts, a boldness of the unction of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Jesus, we pray in your precious name. And everybody said, Jesus bless them. Jesus bless them. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus. to heaven this morning. Worship with us today. Come on. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Oh, we worship you, Lord. That is who you are.
hearts and touch lives. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, you can before you leave this place. These altars are open. Come, give your heart and life to Christ. Wherever you are, just stand and lift up your hands and surrender. Say, Here I am, Lord. Here I am. I surrender. I worship you, Lord. Glory. He'll make a way. We believe you don't think there's a way. Working in your life right now. I believe the Holy Spirit is working on you. Will you surrender and let God, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkest hours of your life? That's who He is. Jesus.